I remember a Peanuts cartoon where it showed Charlie Brown bringing Snoopy's dinner on Thanksgiving Day. It's just a bowl of dog food. Snoopy looks at it. He says, this isn't fair. The rest of the world is eating turkey with all the trimmings. And all I get is this stinking dog food, just because I'm a dog. He looks at it for a moment. Then he says, well, I guess it could be worse. I could be a turkey. (laughs) You think about it, you always think of something to be thankful for. Amen. Be thankful you're not a turkey. Ezekiel chapter 9. Our text mentions the glory of the God of Israel. The glory of God is one of the prominent features in Ezekiel's prophecy. We see visions of the glory of God throughout this book. It is one of the key concepts of the whole Bible. The word glory occurs 400 times in the Bible. Romans 9.14 talks about the advantages that belong to the Israelites. It says about the Israelites to whom pertaineth the glory and the covenants. So the glory of God was peculiarly attached to the Old Testament Israelites. That word glory, it's a Hebrew word, and the root meaning is the idea of weight and worth. Some things are worthy because of their weight. And the glory of God means the worthy weight of God in all its splendor. It's how God chooses to reveal himself to his people. Whatever God does is glorious. Amen. We think about the glory of God. We we trace this concept of the glory of God throughout the Old Testament. Remember the Israelites when they came out of Egyptian bondage on their way to the promised land. There was that glory cloud that led them. And uh, that was the presence of God directing them and protecting them on the way. Then they have the tabernacle. They build the tabernacle and when it's completed, the glory of God comes down upon that tabernacle. And that's God's presence in the midst of these people. Later on, they build the temple. Same thing happened. The glory of God comes down upon that temple. The presence of God is there dwelling among his people. And you follow that through the Old Testament. Then you get to the New Testament. And there you find the glory of God revealed not in a place, but in a person. In the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Notice this, in the face of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came, God's presence and God's glory came uniquely into this world. Remember, Jesus was born, the angels came and announced his birth. And we read in John 1, 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Hebrews 1, 3 says Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. When Jesus died on the cross, Son of God dying there in our place, I think again you have a unique revelation of the glory of God. Matter of fact, the Bible says they crucified the Lord of glory. He was buried three days later. He was brought back from the dead. He was raised up by the glory of the Father, Romans chapter 6 says. He went back to heaven, received up into glory. So let's think tonight about the glory of God. And in Ezekiel, He's going to talk about when the glory departed from the temple and from Israel. In the days of Ezekiel, this happened, and Ezekiel was a witness of this. 
Now don't panic, we're going to cover three chapters here, but we're just going to survey these chapters to show you what Ezekiel saw in the departing of the glory of God. He's already had four visions of the glory of God, going back to chapter 1. In chapter 3, on two occasions, the glory of God is manifested again to Ezekiel to encourage him. And we need that today. We need some sense of the glory of God in our presence. As Matt said, he quoted from the Bible, when two or three are gathered together in my midst, there am I with them. I, I love to hear people say when they're leaving a service, I felt the presence of God today. I hope that's true every time we come together. That we feel the presence of God, that the glory of God is manifested in our presence. In chapter 8, he's carried in the spirit over to Jerusalem, to the temple. Remember, Ezekiel's over in Babylonian captivity. But the spirit of God transports him back to Jerusalem, back to where these people are. And God is saying, my glory is not going to remain. His glory will soon depart. Remember, if you were here last week, we talked about the abominations that uh, Ezekiel witnessed that was going on and how God's punishment must be poured out upon these sinful people. They had allowed idols to come in. And they were trying to worship Jehovah and these idol gods. God's not going to share His glory with others. Now in chapters 9 through 11, we have the vision of the departure of the glory of God. We see it at the mercy seat. It moves to the threshold. It moves to the eastern gate. And the last time Ezekiel sees the glory of God is on the Mount of Olives. And there it departs and leaves. God's glory of power and blessing left Israel. That, no, he can do that. He can leave a nation. When a nation loses its sense of God consciousness, when that nation scorns God and forsakes God, that nation can lose the blessing and power of God. I'm thinking about America, aren't you? I believe America has been blessed of God. You look at our history and, and you can see how God has provided and protected this nation. Reminds us of Proverbs 14, 34. There it says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Where is America today? Has our nation lost the presence, the power, the glory of God? Has he departed? Can we get it back? We'll take revival, won't it? To get it back. Hey, that can happen to a church. You know, the glory of God can leave a church. If you, if you read in Revelations chapter 2 and 3, you read about the seven churches of Asia and how the Lord condemns them and, and calls upon them to repent. And he says, beware that you lose not your candlestick. What he's saying is a church can lose the very purpose that it's there for. God can cease to recognize the church as a church. They may meet every Sunday. They may have services. And yet God's glory has departed. And God no longer sees that as one of his churches. That happens. God forbid that it ever happens here. I think it can happen to a home. I think a family can be living for the Lord and serving Him and, and enjoying His blessing and His presence, and yet they can allow idols to come in, and the glory of God can depart from that home. They can lose the blessings they once had. It can happen to an individual. Remember Samson? Remember the story of Samson? Who was filled with the Spirit of God and he went out in the power of the Spirit of God. But one day the Spirit left him, didn't it? And Samson didn't even know it. 
Bible says he went out and shook himself, not knowing that the Spirit of God had departed. And the enemy took him and defeated him and enslaved him. So there's something in this lesson for us that we might beware of what happened to Israel might happen to us. As an individual, as a family, as a church, as a nation, this could happen. Let's survey quickly these three chapters and learn something about this. Chapter 9, we see the glory of God destroying. You read about uh, verse 1. It said, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. I think he's talking about angels here. These are destroying angels. Angels of judgment that God sends upon Jerusalem. There's another angel in verse 2 who has a rider's ink horn by his side. And these angels come in. And he says in verse 4, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Go among my people, and I want you to mark those who are praying and weeping over the sins of their city. Mark them. You'll find out why a little bit later. God is going to bring judgment. These destroying angels, these angels of death are sent to bring judgment upon these people. He said to them, let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity, verse 5. Slay utterly, but don't come upon them that have the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. And they began at the ancient men which were before the house. In verse 8, they cried and said, Oh, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel and thy pouring out of thy fury? He said unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great. Verse 10, Neither will I have pity. Can you imagine this happening to America? Can you imagine the judgment of God? I mean the wrath of God has poured out upon this nation. And God has no pity in his judgment. There were people weeping and praying for Judea. How many people are praying and weeping over America today? Is he marking those in our country who have a burden for the sins of America, who have a burden for revival? Coming once again to this nation? But you think, preachers, there's probably few that are being marked that way. I want to tell you something. The faithful remnant, God's always had a faithful remnant. There's, I'm sure there's one in America. A faithful remnant of God's people who love the Lord and hate sin and pray for their country. I think God still marks those, as Brother Matt talked about, who are faithful, who serve him. What if the Lord, now he sends these angels, he says, begin at my sanctuary, didn't he? What if the Lord visited his churches, and he sends an angel to mark those who show up on Sunday night to worship and pray and seek God? You realize that many churches are closed down on Sunday night? A lot of churches don't meet on Sunday night anymore. So if he went to them, he'd find an empty church building. Then among those who are having services, he might not find only a handful who show up. But I think that's when God would send his angel to mark those who have a burden for their country would be on Sunday night. When the few who have a burden will be here. 
Aren't you glad you're here? Don't you feel sorry for those heathen that didn't come tonight? They don't even know I'm talking about them, do they? You go tell them. What about it? I tell you what, this country does not know or appreciate what it owes to the faithful saints who do show up on Sunday night and early on Sunday morning to pray and call out unto God and seek God's blessing and seek revival upon this nation. God punishes sin. Be sure your sin will find you out. But God also preserves saints. We have these people being marked. And he said, don't come near those that have been marked. Judgment does not fall upon them. They are preserved. By the way, if you've been saved, you've been marked. You've been saved, you had the seal of the Holy Spirit of God upon you. I have the mark on my soul. That Hebrew word for mark was actually speaking of a mark in the form of a cross. Mark the people with the mark of the cross. Hey, do you have that mark on you today? Paul said, Galatians 6, 17, Let no man trouble me. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the mark of Christ upon us. We'll be brokenhearted over sin. We'll weep for our nation, for our homes. After the remnant had been marked, the punishment began. He said, begin at my sanctuary. Write this verse down in your notes. 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has now come that judgment must begin at the house of God. You see that? Where's God start? With his people. God looks at his people. And listen. God judges his own house. He deals with the sin of his own people first. And let me remind you, the sin of God's people is worse than the sin of lost people. Because we sin against the light. We know better. And when we sin, we're sinning against the light of knowledge. We see the glory of God moving. It leaves the holy of holies. It moves to the threshold of the temple. Now we go to chapter 10. We see the glory of God delaying. It's lingering here. We have another vision similar to chapter 1. With some added details. Verse 4 takes us with the moving of the glory of God. It's now filled the house and court with its brightness. God's getting ready to go. But he doesn't want to go. God does not want to to leave it. He is lingering, hoping his people will repent. Folks, God does not want to leave your life. God does not want to remove his power and his blessing. He's waiting for us to repent. He lingers, giving us every chance. God doesn't want to leave a church and remove a candlestick. He's looking for those in that church who will stand in the gap and intercede on her behalf. Go to Ezekiel 22. Look what it says here about Israel. Ezekiel 22, look at verse 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. How many times has that been true in a church? Where God's about ready to move the candlestick and he's looking through that congregation. He's looking for somebody to stand in the gap and intercede on behalf of that church. And he finds none. How sad. How sad that is. He may be looking for somebody in a family 
He's about ready to remove his blessing from a family. And he's looking for one member of that family to stand up and intercede on behalf of that family. Look at verse 18. The glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. It's moving. Look at verse 19. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels also were beside them and everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. It's moving. See it? You see God is lingering. God is reluctant to leave. God does not want to punish his people. Folks, God is long-suffering. God is patient. It's not God's will that any perish, but all come to repentance. He'll leave, but he doesn't want to. He keeps waiting for that backslider to call out to him in repentance. Like the father of the prodigal son, God watches for his prodigals to come back to him that they might be reconciled. Then in chapter 11, we see the glory of God departing. Look at the problem here. Look at verse 1. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward. And behold, at the door of the gate five and twenty men, among whom I saw Jehaznael, the son of Azur, and Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. This said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in this city they say it's not near God's judgment is not near let us build houses this city is a cauldron and we be the flesh he's saying this city is like a big bowl of soup and we're the choice meat of that soup God's not going to judge us You know, a lot of preachers do that today. They don't preach on judgment, do they? They don't call upon people to repent of their sins. These are those ear-tickling preachers who say that God will not judge us. Look over in Jeremiah. Back up to Jeremiah chapter 5. Look at verse 31. Jeremiah talked about these guys. He says, a horrible thing is committed in the land of Israel. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. My people love these ear-tickling preachers. They say, judgment's not coming. God will not judge us. What happens? The people hear these false preachers and they don't repent. They don't get right with God and judgment does come. And the wrath of God is poured out. That's the problem. It was true then, it's true today. Look at verse 4 through 7, chapter 11. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord. Thus have you said, O house of Israel. For I know the things that come into your mind. We talked about the pictures of the mind last Sunday, didn't we? You have multiplied your slain in the city. You have filled the streets thereof with the slain. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, your slain, whom you have laid in the midst of it, they are the flesh, and this city is the cauldron. I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. Add verse 11. 
This city shall not be your cauldron, neither shall ye be the flesh in the midst thereof, but I will judge you in the border of Israel. God is saying, hey, not only are you not the choices meet in the pot, you're not even in the pot. You're not as safe as you think you are. Sometimes I think America has this idea that we are the choice meat in this world pot, that we are immune to the judgment of God. Is that true? Things have been shaken up a little bit these last few years, haven't they? You think God is trying to wake America up? Do you think God is trying to get our attention? Go to verse 16. Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, Although I have cast them far off among the heathen, though I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the country where you've been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. He scattered them in captivity. But there's always a message of hope for God's people. God says, Ezekiel, you tell them, though I've scattered them, I'll bring them back. I'll bring them back. And I think we've seen that in our day and time. There's the promise. See, Ezekiel's overwhelmed by all of this. And God gives him a, a series of promises here, a series of I wills. God promises to restore Israel back in her land. Look at verse 22. Then did the cherubim lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood up on the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. That's the Mount of Olives. The glory of God departed from the Mount of Olives. Think about that. The glory of God departed from the Mount of Olives. Went back to heaven. Go to Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel chapter 43 and verses 1 and 2. Look at this. You'll find that God gives Ezekiel hope for the future. It says in verse 1, Afterward he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looks toward the east, and behold, now look at this, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Verse 4, And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. It's back. The glory had departed. It left the Mount of Olives. Hey, folks, that's where it's coming back to. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns, His feet are going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. The glory departed from there. The glory's coming back. He's going to enter into the temple and his glory will fill that place. He's going to sit on the throne of David. The glory's coming back. We know that when Jesus came the first time, a measure of that prophecy was fulfilled. I mean, the glory of God returned in the person of Jesus Christ. But in a large sense, that glory was shrouded in human flesh but when he comes again when he comes as we say in glory right he comes in glory that same mount where Ezekiel saw the glory depart that glory shall return where it left it's going to return Christ will come down King of kings and Lord of lords and begin his millennial kingdom here on earth. The glory of God will be back to stay. 
So what does this mean to us? Folks, we need revival. America needs revival. When the glory comes back, it's just another way of saying revival has come. Some say America is experiencing revival today, but I don't see any evidence of it. Oh, there's great clouds that assemble to hear these ear-tickling preachers. They fall down, whoop and holler. That's not revival. Folks, we'll have revival when we sense the awesome presence of God in this land. When multitudes are coming to Christ and being saved and turning their backs on sin. We'll see a pronounced improvement in the morality of America. That's revival. Psalm 85, 6. Wilt thou not revive us again? Then in verse 9, that glory may dwell in our land. Revival will bring the glory of God back. Do we need revival at Florence Street? A lot of our people are living for the Lord. I'm convinced of that. We've got some faithful members here. We also have many members that are not faithful, that are not serving the Lord. Overall, I think we need revival. I think we need to pray more. I think we need to witness more. I think we need to get more serious about the kingdom of God. But we're thinking about revival for the church. It begins with us personally, doesn't it? We need to ask ourselves, do I need revival? Do I need a personal revival in my heart, in my life? Ask yourself this question tonight. Brother Sam, musicians, come prepare for the invitation. Ask yourself this, what would this church be if every member was like me? If every member was just as faithful as I am, how many souls would be saved if every member was like me? How large would our offerings be if everybody gave just like me? How much praying would get done if every member prayed just like me? These are personal questions, aren't they? But we need to examine ourselves. Do you need a personal revival? Folks, when we get right with God, put Him first in our lives. Then the glory will come upon us. Can we pray tonight, Lord, send a revival and let it begin with me and my house? Do you want the glory of God in your life? Again, I'll tell you, you have as much as you want. Amen? You have as much as you want. Are you saved? If you're not saved, you need to come and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 